Happy Friday, everyone. Today is Friday. How many of you have been waiting for this day all week? <laughs> yeah. How many of you have been counting down the days, actually crossing off the days? I, I know how you feel. I actually used to feel the same way. I used to literally cross off the days in my calendar and would be so sad when I had to cross off a Monday so far away from the weekend and then finally get to that Saturday and Sunday and then do it all over again. And then I started to think that crossing down the days until the day you die isn't actually a great way to live your life. And so about six years ago, I decided to try to do something a little different. I decided that instead of putting a big X through my calendar, I was gonna try to write down something good that happened to me that day. And something truly amazing started to happen. Instead of focusing my energy on getting through the day, I was focusing my energy on finding something good to write about. Social scientists have known for years that the things we do every day, our habits, shape the very fabric of who we are. By training my mind to think more positively, I was turning myself into a more positive and optimistic person. And while I never thought this would have any implications for my life, it ended up helping to turn me into the person I am today. So a lot of studies have shown that entrepreneurs are the most optimistic people on the planet. Starting a business is really hard. You're bound to fail. 90% of people who start businesses do fail. But serial entrepreneurs, the people who start businesses over and over again, the one trait that they have in common across continents is that they are irrationally optimistic. Perhaps the best example of this is Steve Jobs, whose combination of delusion and optimism was so strong that it literally defied reality. He had coined the term reality distortion field to describe the effect that he had on the other employees at Apple. After graduating from college, I joined the Peace Corps. And I found myself in a small village in Niger, West Africa, in a rural mud hut, really excited to spend the next two years there. And then something terrible happened. About seven months into my Peace Corps experience, there was a terrorist attack. A West African version of Al-Qaeda came into the capital city and kidnapped and killed two Frenchmen, and we were forced to leave. At the time, when that, all of that was happening, I was putting the final touches on a project that I had planned to spend the next two years working on, a project to grow Moringa in my village. Some of you might be thinking, Moringa? What's that? I actually hadn't heard of it until I went to Niger, and it's, it's a tropical tree. The leaves are more nutritious than kale, and they provide a complete protein, similar to quinoa. I had started eating it myself, because I'm a vegetarian, and living off beans, rice, and millet isn't actually a, a very fulfilling diet. And so a couple people in my village had told me about Moringa. And I started to do a little research into this plant, and I realized that the tree grows in hot, dry places across the globe. It's a subtropical tree. And it actually prefers dry, sandy soil and grows without very much water. And so this moringa plant grows in the same places in our world that have the highest rates of malnutrition. But despite all of the nutritional properties of moringa, the protein, the vitamin A, the potassium, the calcium, and the vitamin C, no one in my village was eating it. And so I started to talk to them about that and figure out you know, what can we do to get more people in Niger, one of the countries with the highest rates of malnutrition in the world, to eat this super nutritious plant. And the feedback was clear. We're not gonna grow a crop that nobody's gonna eat. So if you can find a way for us to make a living growing this, then sure, we'll grow it. And all of that, had, and that inspiration had come to me right at the moment when I got kicked out of Niger. So following the terrorist attack, the Peace Corps evacuated everyone. We came back to the US. And this ladder I had built for myself, this career ladder of high school, college, <laughs> Peace Corps, grad school, and then some fancy international development job, all of that had shattered before my eyes. And like so many millennials, I found myself back in my childhood bedroom, hanging out with my parents. And I got really depressed. <laughs> 
And so I had stopped writing in my calendar, and as I was unpacking all of my boxes, I found that calendar again, and I decided I was going to force myself to find something good about the situation I was in. And actually, that, at the day, that day, at the time, I was walking through an aisle in Whole Foods, and I started looking around, and I saw quinoa, and I saw acai, and I saw chia, and I started thinking about how much Americans love superfoods. We love them so much. We're actually the largest market for superfoods in the world. But no one I knew had ever heard of Moringa, even though all the research I'd done shown that this superfood was really super. So I got together with some of my friends from high school and convinced them that my delusions were in fact inspirations and that we were going to start a company that introduced Moringa to the US market. Every big idea has its very humble beginnings. Ours was farmer's markets. So we started out um, in some local farmer's markets in Oakland. We spent all day Saturday making this Moringa products, all day Sunday selling them, um, and then went back to our day jobs on Monday. And the feedback was pretty clear. We needed to find a way to make this bitter green taste good and find a way to make Americans actually want to eat it. And so we took our inspiration from this peanut snack in West Africa called Kuli Kuli. And they make it into a little ball, and often when I was in Niger, they would add moringa leaves to it to make this really delicious green nutty snack. And so we added in some moringa, added, ended up adding some almonds, some dates, some cherries, um, and came up with these Kuli Kuli bars. And much to my high school friends turned co-founders' surprise, these were a hit. We sold out at almost every farmer's market we did. But it quickly became unsustainable. We were spending our entire weekends making and selling bars and going back to our day jobs on Monday totally exhausted. So being millennials, we decided to turn to our community for support in the form of crowdfunding. We launched a campaign on Indiegogo, and actually the night before we launched, I changed the goal. I decided that instead of $25,000, which is what most food campaigns raise, I was going to up it to 50 and just see what happens. And so I woke up that morning, 6 a.m., and it was at zero, and it stayed at zero for a couple hours. And then I, I called my co-founders and said, can you put in 100 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> and then we raised $25,000 in 24 hours. The campaign totally went viral. And that day really changed things for me. I realized that Despite the fact that I was 23, despite the fact that I had no money and no food industry experience, I had managed to successfully launch a crowdfunding campaign and a business that was doing my dream, doing what I wanted to make happen. And it kind of reminded me of when I was little and playing soccer. And my coach had told me, you know, before you get onto that field, just envision yourself scoring the goal. And I wasn't really good at listening when I was younger, so I didn't listen that often. But when I did, I was actually much more likely to score just by envisioning that it was possible. So today, I run a company called Cooley Cooley that sells Moringa products in 800 retailers nationwide, including Whole Foods, Kroger, and Sprouts. But more importantly, we've been able to make an impact that I never would have thought possible making bars in my parents' kitchen. We're now supporting 800 women farmers and have planted over 200,000 Moringa trees. It's not always easy. There are times when it feels like it's all going to turn to dust. About six months ago, there was a huge fire in our Moringa cooperatives in Ghana, and all of the trees burned down. And of course, that was about a month before we were supposed to launch our new Moringa powder nationwide with Whole Foods. And I thought we were out of business. We had no Moringa. And I was paralyzed by fear and didn't know what to do. And I realized that though the danger was real, that we had no Moringa, the fear wasn't. It was a product of my own thoughts. It was my own creation. And I could change that mindset. And so I turned that fear into optimism and contacted every Moringa supplier on the globe. We ended up finding some incredible new partners, and we're now sourcing Moringa not only from Ghana, but from Haiti and Nicaragua as well. And 
So making the impossible possible starts by believing it can be done. A combination of mild delusion and optimism opens up conversations and makes opportunities more likely to happen. I'd love everyone listening to this to just think of something that would make you want to put hearts around your day instead of X's. Take a minute, a minute to hold that idea in your mind and think about why you're not doing it. Do you think that it's impossible? Think about how good it would feel to make it happen. And then go home and take one small step towards making it happen. Because sometimes when life throws you lemons, you need to go and plant that moringa tree. <laughs> it might just be your next great idea.